All right, so let's talk about B-cell lymphomas. Again, I'm, I'm covering for Dr. Uh, Subtil, but I gave a talk at the Academy last year, and I'm going to give you... Here there is some therapy. I'm going to bypass the therapy and just talk a, a little bit about some of the important issues about B-cell lymphomas of the skin. So we know that the normal skin has very few B-cells. You only find a few B-cells close to a nexa. Probably that's why the incidence of B-cell lymphoma, unlike lymph nodes, uh, is very low. Uh, this is the annual incidence. Uh, we know that there is a wide variation on distribution based on geography, and that's because we are very confused about those B-cell lymphomas. I'll try to explain what's the source of confusion, but if you look at the incidence of, uh, of uh, marginal, so the main ones are marginal zone, follicle center lymphoma, leg type, and if you look at the percentages, it's all over the place. So how does the WHO classify primary cutaneous B-cell lymphoma? The majority of them are going to be indolent, low-grade, follicle center lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, big confusion between those two, with small percentages of the diffuse large cell and intravascular uh, lymphomas and other subtypes. So let's, pay, uh, let's look at the distribution of, the, of, the, of those cases. Overall increase with age, but interesting to know that the, this primary cutaneous diffuse large B-cell lymphoma leg type, the older you are, the, 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 the more likely to have this type of lymphoma. So those are lymphomas with an activated B-cell phenotype, highly aggressive, typical of very elderly patients. At the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the primary cutaneous marginal zone lymphomas, which can be seen at any age, but there is definitely a subset of patients young, especially young women. So definitely these, these are like female predominance and early presentation. We have primary cutaneous B-cell lymphomas, we have secondary cutaneous, so any advanced nod nodal or extranodal B-cell lymphomas can involve the skin. Sometimes <clears throat> for the pathologist or clinician, may be difficult to, die, to know whether you are dealing with a primary cutaneous or a secondary cutaneous. Um, so, in general, the secondary cutaneous are multifocal, larger, deeper, a more pure population of tumor cells. As, as a broad lines, that, those clues may help you a little bit. And any, type, any subtype of systemic lymphoma has been reported in the skin. So, the ones that you are going to encounter, both dermatologists and pathologists in your clinical practices, for the most part, are going to be the low-grade B-cell lymphomas. And the big question is, are we dealing here with a low-grade B-cell lymphoma or are we dealing here with a pseudo-lymphoma? And again, it has a big repercussions for, for the patients. And you'll see how it's not so difficult. Those are typical cases of cutaneous lymphoid hyperplasia. They tend to be single lesions. They tend to have a specific sites like ear, nose, the nipple, the scrotum, common places. And they respond well to, surger, to surgery. You're going to find uh, germinal centers. The germinal centers are completely normal looking. You don't have any, not, not much irregularity. They have this gradient of growth that reflects a benign uh, morphology. Histologically, you see those, uh, those uh, um, uh, nuclear debris laden macrophages, uh, tingible body macrophages, centrocytes mitotic rate, typical morphology of a germinal center. Some of those cases are due to uh, like plastic surgery, like this patient, you may even detect the metal by X-ray spectroscopy. Um, so when you see a case of a cutaneous lymphoid hyperplasia, the first thing you have to do is consider a reactive condition. Has had the patient had any surgeries, a foreign body tattoo, vaccine, acupuncture? So is there a reason why this infiltrate is there? A tick bite, tick bites, not so much mosquito bites, but tick bites can cause very profound, uh, 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 what's, what's called um, lymphadenoma cutis, a very, a very reactive uh, process. Lupus paniculitis, morphia profonda can have this type of germinal centers. A lymphomatoid folliculitis uh, on the face, 
with rupture of, 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 uh, of keratinous cyst can also have germinal centers. Rarely, those other conditions can have it too. Then there are two conditions that be, to be very aware of. One is uh, IgG4-related disease. Those patients can present with facial lesions besides a GI tract and other locations. Uh, they have a lymphoid infiltrate with lots of B cells, lots of plasma cells. Uh, you can have germinal centers, a very sclerotic background. And if you do an IgG4 on serum or at the tissue, you'll find the predominance of IgG4. IgG4 usually is not seen. So those cases of plasma cell-rich reactive lymphoid process, look for IgG4. Another condition in Asian patients is what's called Kimura's disease. Um, they often have uh, lots of eosinophilia in the blood or in the background hyper IgE, they often have a nephrotic syndrome, less fibroplasia, and often without, with, with fewer uh, IgG for plasma cells. As we mentioned, Borrelia can cause a reactive process. Borrelia in Europe has been reported associated with lymphomas, not so in the United States. We'll talk about that. Now, we know that primary cutaneous marginal zone lymphomas, and probably even extern, all the externodals, they may go through a chronic uh, reactive uh, phase. So how do we distinguish those three conditions which clearly overlap? Reactive process is not going to have a positive B-cell clone, bimolecular, no evidence of light chain restriction. If you find light chain restriction and a positive clone, you may call it marginal zone lymphoma. Follicle center lymphomas may have light chain restriction at the membrane, but not by mRNA or protein level. So purely at the surface, they, those two are going to have positive clonality. So in broad terms, is what may help us, the tools that may help us distinguish those two conditions. Now, let me show you an example of a patient of mine. This patient had uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis early on had a polyclonal cutaneous lymphoid infiltrate, polyclonal by immunohistochemistry, but in situ hybridization, polyclonal by PCR, eventually, or after one year, evolved into a true lymphoma with a positive uh, uh, kappa-restricted process and positive clonality. When we review the histograms of the clones, the same clones were seen early on, but again, the same issue we saw earlier with those subclones of CTCL. So the report you get from molecular is not very precise, and those evolving clones from a, hyperpl a hyperplastic process to a quote-unquote true lymphoma, they may not be reported. Interestingly, many of those marginal zone lymphomas often have a predominance of CD4 cells. In this case, we did flow cytometry. A big predominance of CD4 cells and often have a small amounts of T cell clones. So marginal zone lymphomas in the skin often are driven by T cells. This could be a process related to autoimmunity or could be a process associated with a peripheral T cell lymphoma. We've seen a number of cases like this report Patients with angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma, follicular T helper driven, develop multiple skin infiltrates over time, which may be monotypic or polytypic. And when you find patients with one lesion is kappa restricted, the other one is lambda restricted, be aware that you have a T cell driven lymphoproliferative process. Look for those called T cell lymphomas. The skin lesions may present before the nodal lesions. So, uh, so um, MZLs are often very T cell rich, often this pattern of central B cells, peripheral T cells. Um, so again, is, is an entity that up until the, about 20 years ago, we call those cases uh, reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. Now we have more sophisticated tools now we call them lymphomas, but the majority of those cases have a very benign core. So I'm pushing the HMO, I mean the HMO, the WHO, <laughs> slip of the tongue, that I think eventually they are going to be called uh, like lymphoproliferative lesions because truly they do not behave like, uh, like a lymphoma, like, extern like other GI tract lymphomas uh, uh, will act. 
In any case, all extranodal MZLs, whether they are cutaneous or not cutaneous, they are driven by chronic antigenic stimulation, could be microbial, like H. pylori in the stomach, uh, Campylobacter in the jejunum. We've seen patients with chlamydial orbital infections, Borrelia in the skin, more in Europe than the, in the United States, Hepatitis C. Always we look for autoimmunity, especially Hashimoto's and Jogren's. They often have also molecular defects with translocations which may be site-specific. Those translocations or chromosomal aberrations are not sufficient to drive the malignancy. They are not the driving force, but they just fuel the chronic antigenic stimulation. So you have the chronic stimulation, uh, chronic antigenic stimulation. You have this extra acceleration of those uh, molecular defects, which may bring you up to a lymphomatous phase. But the, without the chronic antigenic stimulation, it's, di it's difficult to reach this diagnosis. Um, so diagnosis challenge, as we mentioned, they overlap with cutaneous lymphoid hyperplasia. On top of it, light chain restriction by in situ hybridization or, uh, or immunohistochemistry is not always there. Clonality of the IgH gene or IgK gene is not as sensitive as, as, the, as the gamma TCR or beta TCR. And also we have a wide variation in the architectural and cytomorphology of those lymphomas. So just to show you the wide variation of cytology of marginal zone lymphomas, Okay, which one of the pathology residents will tell me what's this morphology here? That's what we call like monocytoid. You see very abundant clear cytoplasm. You can have more like lymphoplasmacytic in some areas or purely plasmacytic. You can have immunoblastic looking cells. So a white, you can have centrocyte-like cells, centrocyte-like cells in marginal zone lymphoma. So all those types can be seen. Early MZL often has this multinodular pattern that can resemble a follicle center lymphoma. They are often mislabeled, those cases, as follicle center lymphoma. But if you look, uh, click carefully, there is expansion of the marginal zone, and you have this plasmacytic population. Follicle center lymphomas, they hardly ever have plasma cells. You do not see plasma cells in FC, uh, FCLs. Perhaps they become ulcerated, perhaps in the scalp, but rarely you find this type of process. You may also have lymphoepithelial lesions. Uh, th these like zoning areas which are dark and lighter is very typical pattern of, the, uh, of, the, of those marginal zone lymphomas. Over time, those large hypertrophic germinal centers that are the factory of marginal zone cells, they become uh, atrophic and eventually they become apoptotic and they go away. Sometimes we only identify those remnants of a germinal center by uh, doing a, a BCL6, uh, CD30, so looking at the antigen presenting cells or the germinal center cells. So if you have any doubt, check those margins, uh, those markers to find out if there is any residual. So we figure out, okay, so we often have germinal centers. So is that related to a local stimulus? So we evaluated our cases, and we found that germinal, true germinal centers are seen in about 40% of marginal zone lymphomas. Poor correlation with the extent of disease, poor correlation with the history of trauma or anything else. But we've seen some interesting cases, like this patient had tuberculoid leprosy and developed multiple uh, monotypic plasmacytic populations adjacent to the tuberculoid leprosy. So, clearly a chronic stimulus driving this, this uh, pseudo-malignant proliferation of marginal zone cells. We've seen the same phenomenon in patients with uh, extensive tattoos, patients with Hashimoto close to the scar, patients presenting with uh, an acne former option, and there is literature about those MZLs presenting with what may resemble an acne form process. Maybe an isomorphic uh, a phenomenon is what triggers this chronic inflammatory phase. In general, MZLs more common in male, deep lesions, often very pruritic, and you often find a follicular prominence. Can you see here all this follicular prominence? This follicular prominence translates clinically with this perianexal distribution. Often, especially early on, you see this like vertical growth along the perianexal uh, 
dermis. Over time, they become purely plasmacytic, and those cases have an over, you know, we used to call them immunocytoma, primary cutaneous plasmacytoma, pure plasma cells. In Asia, they call them, uh, in Asia, they call them cutaneous plasmacytosis. Cutaneous plasmacytosis is probably the same uh, process as marginal zone lymphoma. Some of those patients from Asia may have Castleman's disease, they have high serum IL-6. Other patients have positive clonality, so they are true uh, marginal zone lymphomas. So I'm gonna briefly talk about plasmacytomas. Uh, be aware of that uh, the IgD secreting are more commonly uh, presenting in the skin. Those cases are purely plasma cells. The cells are atypical, binucleated cell. Mitosis, you should never see a mitosis on a plasma cells. The presence of Dutchner bodies and markers like CD56 are gonna be a red or HMB45, a red flag that you may be dealing with a cutaneous uh, uh, multiple myeloma. So obviously those patients are a much more serious process. Another condition that presents with a dermal plasma cell infiltrates is the post-transplant lymphoproliferative, lymphoproliferative disorder. Um, this was strongly ever, ever positive in this patient post-transplant. So those cases are typically deep. Remember what we mentioned earlier, almost like a pure population of plasma cells, in this case with very minimal atypia, but very extensive uh, involvement on, on the, on all over the body high positive serum uh, EBV and positive monoclonality. So the, um, the prognosis of those patients is excellent. Five-year disease-specific survival for primary cutaneous MZL, 99%. In Europe, they see a higher incidence of bone marrow involvement. I think those patients, they were not properly staged early on because um, they had such early in, in, uh, systemic involvement, a, a phenomenon that we have not observed here in the States. Very seldom they undergo large cell transformation. Um, so MZL, is it primary cutaneous or not? Patients be aware of the possibility of a secondary cutaneous if they have high tumor burden. Secondary, they often go to the head and neck area. Older patients, subcutaneous and more monomorphous pure tumor populations and fewer other cells. Also, if you do IgM is often positive versus the primary cutaneous, they have more expressions of the isoforms IgG or IgA. We publish our data. We found a very high incidence of GI tract disorders or immunity, which goes along with the, the same finding we see on extra mucosal uh, MZL. So we check in all of our patients, SPEBS, UPEP, Hep C, and we look for uh, Jogren's, Rho, and La. We check for antithyroid antibodies, Borrelia, H. pylori, because again, this communication or this relation with, uh, with GERD often. Um, I'm gonna try to go fast now because I'm gonna bypass. So suspect um, CLL if there is co-expression of C, uh, CD23 and CD5. Cutaneous mantle cell lymphoma, extremely rare. A handful of cases reported initially in the skin. Most of those cases have, are involving the leg and have this blastoid presentation. So a big differential diagnosis with a leg type of a lymphoma. So BCL1 or cycling dependent D1 is going to be very important to uh, diagnose those cases. So let's talk about the other one. Uh, the important one, primary cutaneous follicle center cell lymphoma. An entity that was questioned by many hematopathologists until the WHO 2005. Why was it questioned? Because the, the typical chromosomal defect of nodal follicular lymphomas, the T1418 translocation or BCL2 expression is rarely observed in the skin. And even when it's observed in the skin, it has no prognostic significance. So it's important to look at, uh, at, at the fish or BCL2 because those are indications that you are dealing with a systemic lymphoma or likely to, to indicate a systemic lymphoma. But even if you find them and the staging is negative, does not pretend the poor prognosis. So no evidence of reactive. So one of my fellows from last year is also here, Dr. Oriol Yalamos from Barcelona too. Um, and one of the works he did is that we look at our experience with uh, 
uh, follicle center cell lymphomas. And we found that about 75% of those cases involved the scalp. Most of those patients were men and often patients with androgenetic alopecia. So there may be something going on with this androgenetic alopecia and the distribution of those follicle center cell lymphomas on the scalp. So this is what I call the aureole type uh, lymphoma. Um, so very frequently on the scalp, single lesions, those patients have a very impressive clinical presentation. For the most part, they do very well. You still need to stage them, but they do very well. Other patients have this miliary or agminated facial presentation. The prognosis of those patients is good, but not as good as the ones we talked before. Relapse is quite uh, common. Always have to, we have to look for bone marrow involvement, with the exception of those scalp T1 cases that we don't do any further workup, that PET CT scan and blood work. I'm, not, I'm gonna bypass all these cases. So important for the pathologist. The pattern can be follicular, can be mixed, or can be purely diffuse large cell. So cutaneous infiltrate of diffuse large cells could be one of those very indolent follicle center cell lymphomas. So whenever you see this type of, of uh, diffuse pattern, look for any remnants of a germinal center. You may have to do uh, CD21, CD35, uh, but if you, uh, if you find any remnants of, of a germinal center, you're probably dealing with a follicle center cell lymphoma and not with the leg type, which is this highly aggressive that does not present any nodularity. So in the scalp, they are difficult to, uh, to appreciate the, 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 the architecture because you have all the distortion of the follicular units. Often, large B cells are very fragile, much more so in my experience than T cell large cells. So we often have all this crash artifact. Sometimes we do flow cytometry, we may be able to find a few more markers there. So um, the immunohistochemistry BCL2 uh, negative, with the exception of about 10%, that again does not pretend the poor prognosis. Uh, FOXP1 also is a marker of activated B cells. It's seen rarely in follicle center cell lymphomas. Those patients are usually the leg type. Um, but some of, there is a little bit of overlap, as I will mention. So diffuse pattern can be seen. Do CD35, CD21, CD23. Look for these remnants of follicular dendritic cells. As I mentioned, the molecular has no impact. So diffuse large B cell lymphomas uh, could be follicle center lymphomas, as we mentioned, or this leg type that's much more aggressive. There are also other cases, the blastoid, uh, a mantle cell, marginal zone lymphoma that can present with the same type of distribution. So the leg type, typically elderly patients, typically women, could be one leg, could be both legs. The more localized the process, the better the prognosis. Patients with one single lesion do very well. The morphology is very uh, characteristic. No evidence of nodularity whatsoever. Again, very important. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of looking for any remnants of germinal centers. Completely diffuse the cells, very large, very round, very prominent nucleoli, high mit mitotic rate in those cases. Strong MAM1 expression, strong FOXP1 expression, strong IgM expression, negative for Eber. Um, so IgM may help, but notice how uh, so we often check for IgM, but the follicle center lymphomas that happen to involve the leg, they also are often positive for IgM. So in the, back, in, in the, in the, in the setting of a B-cell lymphoma diffused large cell from the lower extremities, it doesn't matter very much whether it's a leg type or a follicle center type. Patients with this type of distribution in the lower extremities do have a poor prognosis. So activated B phenotype, the, the important thing for you to remember is the, this MIT-88, which is a toll-like receptor uh, analog that uh, all pay, about 70% of the patients have a, 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 a leucine 65 to proline point mutation, very specific for all those cases. Uh, this study was done on paraffin section, so the authors believe that even the ones that were negative are probably positive. So this may be a driving uh, gene mutation for those, uh, those patients. I'll bypass this one. Patients can present with a diffused uh, intravascular B cell. 
important to recognize because they often have CNS involvement, very aggressive. They have defects on the uh, leukocyte adhesion molecules like CD11A or CD18. Uh, uh, can be primary cutaneous sometimes within a, 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 germ, within a, a capillary hemangioma. And then we have those EBV positive B cell lymphoprol lymphoproliferative disorders, patients who are on methotrexate, elderly patients. B those B cell lymphomas are angiocentric, strongly EBER positive. So be aware and look at how they look almost like exactly like the ones we talked about before of those CD8 granulomatous. Big overlap between lymphomatoid granulomatosis, elderly type lymphomas, angiocentric, angiodestructive, EBV uh, driven. This was a, a methotrexate uh, patient, renal insufficiency, high methotrexate levels, and this LYP-like presentation with the same type of, I'm going to bypass all this stuff. And I think that's all I have for you. We have a lot of little zebras, but no time to discuss. Thank you all for your attention.